Good morning, you guys. We're going to be talking about engine performance testing today. We're going to begin with a general nature, uh, what the general nature of engine performance is. So engine performance, we're going to define as the proper functioning of five engine systems. And somebody could say, hey, there's another way to sort of categorize them. And I could agree. Yeah. But the way we'll do it first is the engine proper. And when we say that, we mean cylinder power. In other words, is the engine, does the engine have compression? Is the engine functioning as it's supposed to be functioning? Um, is the cylinder making power such that we don't have a misfire, the engine runs well, we get good acceleration, good drivability, etc.? Secondly, is the electrical system functioning properly? And normally when we think about engine performance, we don't usually think about electrical, but um, uh, the charging system has to be making enough voltage and uh, current these days to, for computers to want to operate the fuel pump and other um, engine systems properly to make the engine to perform well. Third, the ignition system. So the ignition system, of course, has to do with that system that makes the spark to ignite the air and fuel or the diesel and air. Um, so is the ignition system functioning properly? Okay. Fourth, the fuel system. So is the fuel system delivering the correct amount of fuel at the right time? And going back to ignition system, is the ignition system make, making the correct spark and delivering it at the right time as well? But is the fuel and air being metered? That's the term that we use. Metered would be regulated um, into the engine properly. We don't want too much fuel because we get bad fuel economy and poor uh, emissions. Um, we don't want too little fuel because we run lean and we tend to melt things and also get poor emissions. So um, fuel system would be our fourth system. And our fifth system would be computer controls. And computer controls are going to be all of those systems that regulate the other systems, meaning they're going to regulate the fuel system. The, com the PCM, which is the engine con uh, computer, is going to regulate the fuel system, the ignition system, charging system, or electrical. And it's not going to regulate cylinder power, but it is going to monitor it by way of a crankshaft position sensor looking at um, acceleration rate and deceleration rate. Uh, and, and engine RPM rate of the um, crankshaft and then turning on the check engine light if we notice a rapid deceleration happening meaning we think a cylinder is misfiring. Having said these five things I want you to remember this and I'm going to put this we're talking about engine performance but I want to talk about just a much simpler way of looking at it. Every engine needs four things to run. You need compression, you need fuel, and when we say fuel, we, what's implied is also air. So compression, fuel, you need spark, and you only need one other thing for an engine to run. Everything has to happen at the right time. Compression, fuel, and air, spark, and everything has to happen at the right time. If you have that, the engine runs, period. That knowledge will serve you well if you're ever trying to work on an old engine or an engine that car hasn't run for a long time. If you've got compression, and fuel's getting into the cylinder, and there's spark, and everything's happening at the right time, meaning the timing belt or timing chain is on and correctly positioned, the engine's gonna run. Now, it may not run well, because you might have an vacuum leak or something, may, some computer sensor may not be functioning quite right, but it'll run, okay? It'll start, at least. Uh, again, it may not run well. All right, let's continue. So, we're gonna sort of evaluate engine performance or the the optimal performance of an engine in these terms. First, does it make good power? And we'll define power as HP or horsepower and torque. So horsepower is what we call high speed power. Uh, horsepower, um, just think the faster the engine spins, typically the more horsepower we make up until a certain point. Think of torque as low speed power, pulling power, what a dump truck needs. So horsepower would be you're on the freeway, you're going 70, you nail the throttle and you feel it accelerate. That's our horsepower that we're really feeling. If you're at a stop sign and we romp on the throttle and the power pulling away from the light, that's torque or low speed power. Most people talk about horsepower and most vehicles need to be talking about torque because torque is more the usable day in and day out power that we use accelerating from a dead stop, that kind of thing. At the racetrack, we're talking a lot more about horsepower. But if we got a truck, we're talking a lot more about torque, okay? Secondly, we want to think about emissions. So emissions or pollution, and that means low pollution levels. And think about emissions in a number of ways. Yeah, there's the environmental side. We don't want to pollute the environment. 
But there's the other side of emissions, and that is if the engine's running right and running well, we shouldn't be polluting uh, very much because we figured out uh, in the 90s and new millennium, we really finally figured out how to blend power and emissions. Um, and when the engine's running right, it makes good power and doesn't pollute the environment. It's true. You could get more power and compromise emissions. But for all of us on the road where we have speed limits, it, it's, it's unnecessary, really. Um, and, and again, when you get more power and you start doing stupid stuff, you start getting tickets uh, it, at best and accidents at worst. But anyways, so we want emission levels to be low or pollution to be low. Third is economy. So we want good fuel mileage. We want good gas mileage. Okay. So we look at how much, how many miles we can go on a gallon of fuel. Something I want to throw in here is what I call passenger miles per gallon. Another thought to this fuel economy discussion needs to be how many people can the car, the car carry? So if I have my Suburban, they get 17 miles per gallon on the highway and can seatbelt nine people. And a Honda Civic can seatbelt four. It can actually take five, but it's pretty tight at five. But let's say you get four people on a Honda Civic that gets 34, 35 miles per gallon on the highway. Well, how many cars does it take? to move the same amount of people doing the hunt. Well, it takes two. So all of a sudden, the total quantity of fuel that you consume is equal to the Suburban. So all of a sudden you say, well, maybe a Suburban or engine, a larger vehicle isn't so fuel inefficient as long as we've got it filled with people. Now, if I drive my 92 Suburban alone, it's not very fuel efficient, right? My passenger miles per gallon is very low. But it's something to think about. Um, and I always like to tell people, hey, if you want to re, uh, reduce your fuel costs or increase your gas mileage, both for the sake of economics, your pocketbook, and also for the sake of using a natural resource, carpool. Park one car and two of you drive together. Park one car and three or four of you drive together. And all of a sudden, your economy goes way up. Uh, your fuel consumption goes way down, et cetera. Fourth is drivability. Another way we define engine performance. Drivability, like it says, is the smoothness of operation, strong acceleration, <clears throat> ease of starting, etc. cold starting, hot starting, etc. We want the car to function well. We want it to be smooth. We want it to be responsive. We want it to um, give us the power we need. We also, again, we also want low uh, emissions and we want good gas mileage. So drivability is something we got to think about because sometimes we can make a car make a lot of power, but it's not very drivable. Uh, it's not really enjoyable driving experience, etc. So those four things give us a way of looking at, um, sorry, the ca camera's not focusing for a moment. Sometimes it does this and I got to put my air, it goes, I put my hand in front of it and kind of cooperates. I tell it, you back off, buddy. Anyways, um, so that's how we define engine performance when we talk about these things. And it is helpful to think about this when you're working on a vehicle and you're trying to evaluate it, uh, we like to evaluate in terms of all these things to really know if it's running right. So we're going to be doing specific testing. And I have no idea why it just, the camera just freaked out. So let me see if I can get it to come back in. Focus, dude. Okay, we're going to pause for a moment. Okay, we got our camera back working right. So how can we determine that the engine is functioning prop uh, properly? How do we have an idea about engine performance. Well, we can do a number of testings. We can li uh, listen to it, so audibly. We're going to listen to the engine. We're going to listen for problems. I'm going to roll this thing, this card out to a vehicle that definitely has an engine noise that you're going to listen to in just a few minutes. We can listen to it and see if we have an exhaust leak, if we have a valve lifter tick, if we have a belt squeal, or we have a bearing noise, etc. Then we're going to look at it visually, not just the engine itself, which we can look at for leaks coming from the engine or down below the engine, but also we're going to look at the tailpipe and look at the color of the exhaust because if we have blue exhaust, we have oil burning in the engine. So blue exhaust means oil is burning in the engine, and that shouldn't be. Secondly, if we have black exhaust, that means fuel burning, right? Like the lifted diesel uh, trucks running around town, but. Uh, a black exhaust means you're burning too much fuel. We don't really want to be doing that. Third, white or gray smoke means we got water or coolant in the 
in the combustion chamber and it's making steam. Now, I'm not talking about a little plume like this in the morning. That's very, very normal, especially this time of year. And a small puddle on the ground, maybe this big, of water dripping out of the tailpipe is extremely normal. It's just condensation in the exhaust and it's completely normal. I'm talking about a cloud of, you know, 10 foot, 20 foot uh, smoke screen of, of, of steam. Now, it can start small, it could be a five foot plume, but at that point you're kind of wondering, hey, is it just condensation or is there water or coolant actually getting into the cooling system? So um, that's how we look at that. Next is we can smell the vehicle. We can smell coolant burning. We can smell oil burning. We can smell power steering fluid or brake fluid burning. It's actually, all of those have distinct smells and you just have to learn what they smell like. But it does give us an indication and we're gonna look at a car today that has a distinct smell and we're gonna talk about it. And then finally, we can do um, testing, specific testing with test equipment. And um, I'm gonna be showing you different um, uh, PowerPoint presentations on each of the different types of specific testing, power balance and compression and wet compression and leakage and block testing and vacuum testing and oil pressure testing, all these things. So specific diagnosis with test equipment, but never underestimate the power of your senses to tell something by ear, by sight or by smell. Um, we can diagnose a lot of stuff and sometimes we smell things and we got to go, we got to pay attention to our gut instincts. If we smell raw gasoline, something's wrong. We got to solve it. Don't just say, oh, it'll go away. If there's raw gasoline smell, something's wrong. Just like that rotten egg smell at home, the, the natural gas leak, you want to pay attention to that smell and make sure you get the gas shut off and figure out what the problem is. Call the gas company. They come out for free and they'll diagnose what that smell is coming from. All right, let's drag it out to the shop. All right, guys, here we are outside. We got a 2007 um, uh, Chevrolet Silverado. And this one, if we look under the hood, I'll grab the camera here and we'll come on over under the hood. If we look over under the hood and look at the catalyst sticker, if it's here, yes, it is. There it is over here. There's the catalyst sticker. This is a 4.8 liter V8 engine. So there it is. It's a 4.8 liter V8. It's a small V8. You can see four spark plug wires and four coils on that valve cover. Um, I'm going to pull the dipstick out, and I want you to see what the engine oil looks like. So I'll pull the dipstick out. And the engine oil is full and clean. Hopefully you can see it. I know the light's kind of weird. But it is full and clean. Um, I did an oil change on this two weeks ago, and I put thicker oil in it because it had quite a racket. So what you're going to see when I start this vehicle is you're going to hear a lot of clatter, and you're also going to notice that the oil pressure light is probably going to stay on. So let me um, let me pull this in through the window and cut the glare down. Okay. I'll close the door. That might help with the glare. Let's see if you can see this. Yeah, you can see it kind of well. But sorry about the glare. Let me start it. So there's the oil pressure light there. And it's on. Now it just went off, which is good. But when the engine warms up, the RPM drops down, and at idle, that oil pressure light's going to come back on. Listen to the engine. Hopefully you can hear the tapping noise. And that engine tapping noise doesn't sound so bad at the moment, but as the vehicle warms up, it gets worse. Um, the oil pressure light's coming on at idle once it gets warm. If I take it up to like 2,000 RPM, the oil pressure light goes off. Well, this engine, look at the mileage. This 4.8 liter engine has, um, and I've got to see if I can get the information system to move over here. Let me see where I can do it. Give me one sec. There's a way to do it. Let's see. And sorry, I can't remember off the top of my head how to toggle through the information system on this one, and I should have done it 
uh, more quickly. But in any case, this thing has like 345,000 miles. So are we surprised that it has low oil pressure when it was a construction truck and it has that many miles? No, we're not. So our plan is to take the oil pan off, change the bearings in the oil pump and see if we can get oil pressure up because it's a pretty decent truck. Yeah, the paint's not so good. On the other side, it's not so good, but this side looks pretty nice. It's got nice wheels and tires. So this is a fun one to see that if changing um, rod and main bearings um, and oil pump will make the car usable again. Let's see if the oil pressure light's on. Yeah, so the oil pressure light is on. So that means oil pressure has dropped down really low. So you can see it there as well as the TPMS light is on. I'm going to pause this and we're going to go look at another one for smell. Okay, here is a 2003 Tundra that's running. And as it runs, when it gets hot, you can begin to smell burning oil. It's got the 3.4 liter engine and they're notorious for the valve covers loosening up. So up until the other, up until Saturday, these valve cover bolts here and here were leaking oil out the back corners of the valve cover. And this one in particular, this bolt here, 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 and there, and there's one up there. And on Saturday, I went ahead and tightened those bolts. And the result was um, I don't smell the oil burning so much anymore. One other thing about this truck, when you go inside, and I'm going to put my foot on the brake and drop it into reverse, listen. Okay, let me try drive. Okay, it's hard for you to hear, but the transmission was making kind of a whine. You can hear it a little bit, but it has a little bit of what we call a torque converter whine. This one has 245,000 miles. Probably going to need a new torque converter in the automatic transmission, but it's not very expensive. The part's about $200. And we just have to take the transmission out, which on a two-wheel drive like this is not very hard. So you'll also notice back here that we can look at the tailpipe. And you can see a little moisture coming out here on the tailpipe. It's kind of moist. And the color's good. And that's really, really normal. We're not seeing blue smoke, black smoke, or billowing clouds of white smoke. All right, that's it for now. We'll go on to testing next.